Chapter 15, the Pandavas retire timely, verses 47 and 48. So that's 47 on the board. Tadhyanodriktaya bhakya Tadhyanoyadriktaya bhakya Visuda Dishana Pare Tasmin Narayana Pade 
ಏಕಂಥಮತ್ತಯೋಗತಿಂ ಧ್ಯಾನೋದೃತ್ತಯ ಭಕ್ತ್ಯ ಬಿಸುರಾಧೀಶನಾಪರೆ ತಸ್ಮನ್ನಾಯಣಪಾದೈ ಏಕಂಥಮತ್ತಯೋಗತಿ ಧ್ಯಾನೋದೃತ್ತಯ ಭಕ್ತ್ಯ ವಿಸುರಾಧೀಶನಾಫರೆ ತಸ್ಮನ್ನಾಯಣಪಾದೈಕಂಥಮತ್ತಯೋಗತಿ ಧ್ಯಾನ ಪಾಸಿಟಿವ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ ಉತ್ರಿಕ್ತಯ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಫ್ರೀಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಭಕ್ತಿಯ ಬೈ ಎ ಡಿವೋಷನಲ್ ಆಟಿಟ್ಯೂಡ್ ವಿಸುಡ ಪ್ಯೂರಿಫೈಡ್ ದೀಶನ ಬೈ ಇಂಟೆಲಿಜೆನ್ಸ್ ಪರೇ unto the transcendence tasmin in that narayana the personality of godhead shri krishna pade unto the lotus feet ekanta mataya of those who are fixed in the supreme who is one katim destination avapu attained duravapam very difficult to obtain te by them asadbi by the materialists visaya atmabi is absorbed in material needs vidduta washed off kalmasa material contamination stanam abode virajena without material passion atmana eva by the self same body he certainly mm-hmm. so now we're hearing about the pandavas in their final uh part of their journey towards the spiritual world thus by pure consciousness due to constant devotional service they the pandavas attain the spiritual sky which is ruled over by the supreme narayan lord krishna this is attained only by those who meditate upon the one supreme lord without deviation this abode of lord shri krishna known as goloka vrindavan cannot be attained by persons who are absorbed in material conception of life but the pandavas being completely washed off of all material contamination attain that abode in their very same bodies <clears throat> purport according to shri lajiva goswami 
A person freed from the three modes of material qualities, namely goodness, passion, and ignorance, and situated in transcendence, can reach the highest perfection of life without change of body. Srila Sanatan Goswami, in his Hari Bhakti Vilas, says that a person, whatever he may be, can attain the perfection of a twice-born brahmana by undergoing the spiritual disciplinary actions under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, exactly as a chemist can turn gunmetal into gold by chemical manipulation. It is therefore the actual guidance that matters in the process of becoming a brahmana, even without change of body, or in going back to Godhead without a change of body. Srila Jiva Goswami remarks that the word he, used in this connection, positively affirms this truth, and there is no doubt about the factual position. In the Bhagavad Gita 1426, also affirms this statement by Srila Jiva Goswami, when the Lord says that anyone who executes devotional service systematically, without deviation, can attain the perfection of Brahman by surpassing the contaminations of the three modes of material nature. And when the Brahman perfection is still more advanced, by the self-same execution of devotional service, there is no doubt at all that one can attain the supreme spiritual planet Goloka Vrindavan, without a change of body, as we have already discussed in connection with the Lord's returning to his abode without a change of body. <clears throat> that last sentence was like a paragraph. Omagyan timirandasya kira jana salakaya Chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami tinamene namaste saraswati deve gorvani pacharine nirvisesa sunyavari pastyatyade sitarine panchakalpa tarubhisya kripa sindhu pe bhaja Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare hmm. So this verse um, is the not, not quite, yes, it's almost the last verse in a series of verses which describes the perfection of achievement by the Pandavas and their going back home, back to Godhead. It says they went back in the self-same body. So what Jiva Goswami is saying is that even in this life, one can reach perfection even while they still are existing in their present body. Sometimes people think that you have to give up this body before you reach perfection. And that is usually the normal case, the average uh, practitioner of devotional service do, does have to give it this, this body and attain their spiritual body before they can attain perfection. But here it also mentions that of those who have a certain power in their devotional service so great that even in the present existence in the body that they have they can reach perfection uh, that is that is very good in terms of it gives consolation to the idea that yes i can make perfection even while i'm still here but here we see the word washed off it's been mentioned a couple times that to live in the material world means to be dirty. <laughs> it's, a, it's a place of dirt. The contaminations of the three modes of material nature. The more deeper the modes, the more the contamination. Just like if you work in a factory, you might get very dirty. If you work in a, <laughs> a grocery store, you might get less dirty. 
you work in an office, you may be n not so dirty. <laughs> But in, in any way, wherever you are in the material world, there's always some type of what we call contamination. And what is the washing process? The pro washing process is shravanam, kirtanam, vishnu smarnam, to hear and chant the glories of the Lord, which is the essence. Maharaj Parikshit. Um, listen to the glories of the Lord consistently for seven days without a break. And by doing that, he attained pure spiritual consciousness, so much so that at the end, um, Sukadeva Goswami was actually instructing him about getting ready to achieve the spiritual world by saying, do not fear the uh, process of changing your body, because he was meant to be bitten by a snake bird, a toxic, a very powerful snake bird, not just an ordinary one the king of all snake birds, whose poisons was just like liquid fire. And uh, he's instructing him on how to prepare himself to leave the body. But it's not really for Maharaj Pariksit, it's for us. Because Maharaj Pariksit had already attained complete detachment from the material body. Sometimes it's understood. See, sometimes you also see when you work, sometimes you forget, forget about your body. You become so absorbed in what you're doing that uh, the fact that your body is there and working doesn't even become noticeable. And sometimes, of course, when you go under certain operations, some surgical operation, which is very severe, they give you some kind of uh, anesthesia and that numbs the body, numbs the whole body, and then you don't feel any pain during the operation. But the body is still there, although there is no awareness of the body. When you go to sleep at night, you also lose awareness of your physical body, and you float through the world in your subtle body, going into the dream world, and there sometimes you adopt another body but in any case, there are many examples of how one can forget even the awareness of one's body, even while they're in, still in the, in the body itself. Sometimes you see that um, devotees chant and dance in kirtan, and they get so enthusiastic that uh, they forget about their body and just start becoming absorbed in the holy name. And... Uh, uh, that absorption, and even though they may even have physical difficulties or pains or anything, it all goes away during the holy name. But when you stop, then it all comes back, right? <laughs> so sometimes we say, don't stop. <laughs> of course, that may not be practical, but the point is that uh, there are many examples of how we lose consciousness or awareness of the body and even the feelings of the body, the happiness and the pains that are uh, being applied to the physical body. So when one is absorbed fully in devotional service, meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord and executing devotional service, they become unaware of everything, even in the, whatever is going on around them in the material world. So that means that they're actually in transcendental consciousness. So we see that and done in a material way, that's not transcendental consciousness, that's just some obliviousness to the material body. But on the spiritual platform, then we understand, yes, that, that aware, losing that awareness of the material body is the actual um, stage of realization of one's constitutional position as a spiritual being. So the Pandavas, they had gone back to Godhead in the same bodies that they were living on the earth. There's a special gift given to them by the, by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and they attained the spiritual world. We mentioned how even today, when people, certain great saints and sages who have attained perfection, in spiritual life, when they leave their body, their body doesn't even deteriorate like an ordinary body does. 
the same body will maintain its uh, original state of existence, although it's not functioning, the body itself does not deteriorate. There is there's a couple examples in the Christian tradition. There is one great saint, her name was Saint Teresa of Avila in Portugal. And uh, she, when she was, when she died, her body didn't de deteriorate. And it stayed like that for 400 years. Not a not even a slightest amount of deterioration in her body. So, of course, after 400 years, they thought this body must be very special, so they start cutting it up and selling different parts to, <laughs> to people and made a, made a business out of it. But that was a sad affair. But actually, you know, her body was... And then, of course, we have others' examples. If you go to... Um, what is it... Uh, Tirupati, and you see the body of uh, uh, Ramanujacharya encased in resin there. You see, you can actually see, though, this is Ramanujacharya. <laughs> and his body is just is the same form of it was when it was when he was personally present. So that is available. Even now you can see that in Tirupati, in the, in the Sri Rangam temple. So we see that this material body becomes spiritualized when the, the soul is energized in its devotion to Krishna. And then the whole spirit, the whole material body is no longer material anymore. It actually takes on the quality of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And that means no, no deterioration. But in the spiritual world, you get another body, which is your actual body, your eternal body, the body that exist as your uh, uh, constitutional nature to serve Krishna in the spiritual world. So the whole process is being very summarized here. Prabhupada doesn't make so many points, but he emphasizes that we stay fixed in devotional service under the disciplinary actions of the spiritual master. The spiritual master is the guide by which one can elevate their consciousness from the material to the spiritual. The instructions of the spiritual master are the foundation by which one moves forward to the platform of self-realization and then ultimately full God-realization. Those instructions are non-different than, than the instructions coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In fact, they are the instructions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, one who hears regularly and un tries to understand and applies very carefully according to the instructions given can, um, can stay on the spiritual platform simply by meditating on and absorbing oneself in the instructions of the spiritual master. Now, but there are so many instructions given by the spiritual master. Sometimes we see, well, what is the most important instruction? The most important instruction was asked to Srila Prabhupada when he was here. He wanted the devotees who asked him, what is your most important instruction? And he very clearly said to chant 16 rounds on beads every day of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. He made the point on beads <laughs> every day. So that was, he emphasized that this chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the most important of all instructions. Why? Because it's the most powerful, it's the means by which one elevates their consciousness from the material to the spiritual. When you're in kirtan, you're not in, in the material world anymore. <laughs> as long as your consciousness is focused on the kirtan, of course, sometimes we're in the kirtan, but we're not in the kirtan. <laughs> so we have to hear very nicely as the chanter chants, and the chanter has to chant very clearly the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Now, we have to be very carefully to chant very clearly. The sound of the Maha Mantra has to be pronounced according to how it's given in the scriptures. And when Srila Prabhupada was here, there was one very senior devotee. His name was Vishnu John Maharaj. 
And he was known for his kirtan. In fact, he was kirtan maharaj. <laughs> he would do kirtan all the time. He would go out on Harinam and do from 10 to 12 hours a day outside doing kirtan, playing the murdanga and singing various melodies. He became very much known as a kirtan acharya. And after some times, he started to chant the Maha Mantra differently. And Srila Prabhupada picked up on it and called him in his room one day. He said, what is this Ramo? It's not Ramo, it's Rama. He said, try to understand, it's not a Bengali mantra. It's a Sanskrit mantra. So it's Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. He said, if we continue to do this, this will destroy our whole society. He said that. So I was listening to the kirtan today, and I was singing. We, we, I was hearing a lot of Ramos. <laughs> Why do we chant Ramo? Because now we somehow or other are not listening to the mantra itself. And even the chanter sometimes is chanting Ramo. But Ramo, what is Ramo? It's just like maybe somebody's name. Rama, it's actually Rama. You chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It's very important we do that carefully because Srila Prabhupada was very strong and he, very, he strongly chastised Vishnu John Maharaj for using Ramo instead of Rama. And he said, be careful not to do that. And you know, of course, if you go to Bengal, you know, Bengalis, they change all the A's to the O's. But, and that's where it started from, from Bengal. And now it's filtered throughout our whole society. Devotees are chanting Ramo all the time. We have to be conscious of the fact that the mantra should be chanted according to how it's given. And then the efficacy of the mantra will have effect. So someone will might say, well, we know that Krishna's uh, Baba He Janardana, what is it, Baba Grahi Janardana? Well, he, he understands what I'm saying, so even if I say it wrong, it doesn't matter, because Krishna knows my heart. Um, because he takes the essence, and that's true, but Prabhupada emphasized that still we should follow the principles. Just like even we chant, someone asked, you know, Rindayai Tulsi Devai Priyai Kesavasyacha Vishnu Bhakti Pranidevi Satchavachai Namaho Namaha. So someone asked, well, she's Krishna Bhakti. Why do we say Vishnu Bhakti? Yeah, right? She doesn't, you know, she's in, she's Rindavan. Tulsi Maharani is Rindadevi in Rindavan. So why do we say Vishnu Bhakti Pranidevi? Because it says that in the, in the Shastras, the Shastras say Vishnu Bhakti. So when Prabhupada was asked about that, he says, you can't change the Shastras. We have to follow the Shastra. When, uh, when Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya uh, was glorifying Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there was one verse, it said Mukti Pade. And he didn't like it. He said he wanted to refer to Lord Chaitanya as Bhakti Pade instead of Mukti Pade. And when he did, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, You can't say that. You can't change the Shastras. The Shastras say Mukti Pade. Although Bhakti Pade might be more correct according to the, the tattva that's being described. But wherever it says in the Shastras, you have to follow. <laughs> In other words, if the mantras are written in a certain way, there's a reason why. And even though it may seem less connected to the definition, still we have to follow. So in the same way, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I hear devotees chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ramo, Rama, Hare Hare. There's a Ramo and a Rama in the same part of the mantra. There's a few Romas and a few Ramas there. So whatever the reason is, it, it's not a reason. So we should be very careful. 
Only, I'm only emphasizing that because Srila Prabhupada was, really took issue with that directly with one of his senior disciples and very strongly emphasized that we avoid chanting Ramo. <laughs> so that, was, that goes all the way back. I remember one time I was leading a kirtan in, uh, in uh, it was Mangalarti in, uh, in Mayapur. It was a Mangalarti in the morning Mayapur. And there was one lady there, she was ferocious. She would make sure that everybody chanted Rama, even the Bengalis. And so when she would hear them chant Rama, she would chastise them. I mean, really. I mean, she was just some Western lady who was really fixed on the idea that nobody should chant Rama. We tried that in Bengal. That's, that's, that's pretty hard. So she was always ready, and she's listening. So I was leading the Mongol Arti. And so I was chanting, and I was very much aware that she was there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was chanting very carefully, Rama, <laughs> not to get into the Bengali response of Rama. <laughs> so at the end of the kirtan, I'm walking, and she's coming directly towards me. And I'm thinking, oh God, here I go. I'm going to get chastised. <laughs> And she runs up to me and says, Maharaj, thank you for not chanting Ramo. <laughs> <laughs> I felt relieved. <laughs> Got some credit. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, um, and it's many of the, it's, I travel all around and do kirtan in many places around the world. And so many devotees are chanting Ramo. But Prabhupada was very strong about that because he said it is a Sanskrit mantra, not a Bengali mantra. It has to be followed very carefully. So here, when also, it kind of leads into the whole idea that when we execute the process, we have to execute the process very carefully according to the rules and regulations given by the spiritual master, which is the foundation by which all success and devotional service goes. The more we learn the, spirit, the instructions of the spiritual master, and the more we follow them accordingly, the more we get Krishna's mercy. Because the spiritual master, in this case, is Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada, who's not only a spiritual master, he's the founder, Acharya, of the Hare Krishna mantra movement, which means that whatever he delineates or designates or it tells us to do, if we, we follow that, we are actually connecting ourselves with the entire parampara. <laughs> because Srila Prabhupada is the, the, the present link in the parampara. And when we follow that very carefully, and therefore we have to know the instructions of the spiritual master. This is one of the things that is most important, because there's two types of instructions in the spiritual master. There is general instructions and specific instructions. And then when you take those instructions, you divide them again into two categories. One is uh, practical uh, directions and spiritual knowledge. So he gives both. So in the, in the general and specific, sometimes a devotee will get instructions from their spiritual master directly. And one is considered fortunate if the spiritual master tells them, well, I want you to do this service, or I want you to carry out this particular activity. That is considered special mercy. But then again, many of us don't get that specific instruction from our spiritual master. So the general instructions are there in his vakya, which comes in the form of his lectures or in his books, and his conversations, all of these things are all part of the understanding of how we should learn. And if you listen to Srila Prabhupada, some of his more remote types of discussions with his devotees in terms of groom conversations and morning walks, he says things he doesn't say in his books, which are specific to a particular situation that goes on. And therefore, sometimes it appears to be contradictory from what is in his books or what he has said at another time. 
And sometimes that causes devotees to get a little confused. Well, Prabhupada said this and this time. And he said this same thing, referring to the same situation and at another time. Therefore, Prabhupada said, whatever is in my books is the foundation of everything you can follow. He said, I put everything in my books. But we could also learn practical knowledge, which he also gives in his day-to-day uh, -day discussions with his devotees. <clears throat> like sometimes Prabhupada will speak about just the Indian culture <laughs> or even the history of India. You know, he speaks a lot about the history of India. Or he'll speak about his own personal life. Or he'll speak about some specific thing, like he gave, he gave a whole long discussion on money one time. It was a morning walk. He just talked about uh, currency, and the falsity of paper currency, and the value of real precious metals as being the foundation for real wealth. He gets into these, he might be something that is parallel or supportive of devotional life, but not directly. So there's a lot of instructions that Srila Prabhupada gave in a practical way that is very helpful in the execution of our devotional service. So the more we learn the instructions of the spiritual master, the more we can avoid offenses. Just like I see, of course, devotees are aware here, but many devotees around the world I see, when we sit in large groups, and sometimes someone has to walk through the groups because they're, it's very tight. It says if you step over a person, whether you step over their leg or any part of their body, it's an offense. You can't step over a person at any point because the soul is in the body and you're stepping over a living entity in that sense. So a lot of devotees don't know that and they just walk over each other just to get from one place to another. So, but that's a practical thing, but still it has an effect. And if we don't avoid these small little offenses, these things start to accumulate, and then sometimes we find we struggle in our Krishna consciousness. So therefore, there's, as Srila Prabhupada would use the example, um, when in a courtroom, if a person is being tried for a particular crime, and they might make their plea saying, well, my dear honor, my, your honor, my dear judge, I didn't know it was a crime. And Prabhupada said, the judge will say, ignorance is no excuse. <laughs> material energy is like that too. People suffer in the material world because they don't know how to live according to a way to avoid the suffering in the material world. And therefore, they get trapped many times or do the wrong thing on a base simply upon ignorance. So therefore, Srila Prabhupada took so much time, so much effort, and even went into a personal exchange with many devotees just to make clear all of the principles that he wanted to teach. So we would have everything. And sometimes people say, well, did Prabhupada give everything? When you listen to his lectures and when you listen to his, when you read his books and you hear from his devotees, you find he covered every subject. <laughs> every subject. <laughs> Even the highest subjects in, in Krishna, in Sri Vrindavan Dhamma, his intimate associates in, in spontaneous loving devotional service. Prabhupada covered everything. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that we were challenged sometimes that people say, well, I have to go outside to get more. Prabhupada didn't give us everything. I have to go to this other Babaji or this other, you know, self-realized person who sits on the banks of Radha Kund to get the complete understanding. But Bhakti Tarun Maharaj, all oh, glorious is Srila Bhakti Tarun Maharaj, he, he very carefully made a presentation explaining in detail how Srila Prabhupada gave everything. How he gave everything. There's no need to go anywhere else to get any kind of knowledge 
that you might might need in order to execute devotional service. Everything's there in Srila Prabhupada's books. Of course, some of his disciples are writing books based on his books, but that is also our tradition. Just like whatever Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, the Goswamis took that, that knowledge and wrote books on it, <clears throat> just like the Shikshasta compares. Those eight verses, now those eight verses comprise the entire essence of pure devotional service, from all the way from the beginning, all the way up to the highest point of spontaneous loving service to Krishna and Vrindavan in the mood of Srimati Radharani, in those eight verses. And Lord St. Tani only wrote, that's the only thing he ever wrote, was those eight verses. But, <clears throat> but those eight verses comprise everything. And <clears throat> the Goswamis study those verses, especially Rupa, Rupa Goswami and <clears throat> also Jiva Goswami, and, un, and expanded that knowledge into so many other books <clears throat> based on these same teachings in all levels of devotional service. <clears throat> so Prabhupada said that is the duty of the disciples to write books based on whatever the, their spiritual master change said without changing but maybe using different language in order to to communicate this knowledge according to time place and candidate when we see that we have that here many devotees who are part of radha gopinath temple are taking Srila Prabhupada's books and the statements of their spiritual master, expanding on them and keeping the same essence without changing the essence and giving more detail on the explanation by which one can practice devotional service according to the level of mentality that they can understand. <laughs> That's preaching. <laughs> That's preaching. So that is also a responsibility for the disciples to hear from their spiritual master, take that knowledge and, and explain it in different ways in lectures and also to write about it. And uh, therefore, more and more knowledge comes out in a very clear and, and very, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, thorough way that we're even if you look at it from different angles of vision, you'll see the essence according to how it's explained. So, <clears throat> therefore, I really wanted to make that point that this, the knowledge that coming from the spiritual master is the foundation by which we do everything. <laughs> Understand everything. Even Prabhupada, just like it says, well, what's that... <clears throat> Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chitete Koriya Akya Ana Koriya Mani As. That the words of my spiritual master are like <clears throat> my nourishment, my foodstuffs. <clears throat> I don't have to go anywhere else. Ana Komumino Mani As. I am fixed on those instructions of my spiritual master. This is my life. This is my foodstuffs. This is the essence of my existence. Everything is there in the instructions of the spiritual master. <clears throat> but it takes some study, it takes some continuous contact with those instructions to clarify and to understand and learn how to apply in each and every circumstance. <clears throat> and when we do that, then that is perfection in devotional service. <clears throat> There's so much to learn even whatever Prabhupada gave us. <clears throat> we can't even exhaust in, in many lifetimes. Just like uh, when we were in New Vrindavan, I was there for many years in New Vrindavan, and there was this particular time where there was certain uh, changes in the execution of the uh, activities of devotional service, the practical activities start getting into more of a combination of uh, other traditions using some of their uh, worship principles and incorporating them into bhakti. So devotees were um, sitting in the dark in the morning and chanting their rounds in complete darkness with only little candles 
on different places, these little tiny votive candles lighting up the sides. And the idea was that through this dark, we should chant the holy name silently. No one could chant loudly. It was all silent. So this was an idea that came up. And then we were thinking, hmm, this looks pretty good. And a lot of devotees liked it. I even tried it. And But then after a while, uh, we saw that it wasn't working so good. <laughs> but at the same time, devotees started to explore deeper Srila Prabhupada's instructions, and they came up. And Prabhupada actually said something. He said, when you sit in the darkness and you try to meditate, you fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and the devotees were, you could hear a few uh, mantras that were mixed in with the the other mantra, it was called the uh, sleep mantra. That you know that keeps other people awake at night sometimes. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, yeah, Hare Krishna. So yeah, this um, it was like that. But when we first began doing that, we hadn't heard anything about whether it was correct or not. And, we thought it was innovative, and it seemed to have a certain flair to it. And, and when, it, when it was initially instituted, it seemed to be nice. But then again, we saw all the flaws in it. Then we realized, Prabhupada said, don't do it. <laughs> but nobody heard, nobody understood Prabhupada's instructions until somebody found in one conversation, one lady was telling Prabhupada about that type of meditation prompt was that you'll simply sleep, that's all. <laughs> and he was right. So, yeah, so this is an example how re sometimes the remote instructions of Srila Prabhupada uh, come to surface only when a certain situation becomes a deviation. But we have to make sure that we very carefully understand Srila Prabhupada's guidance for us in the practical way. And as we mentioned, there is the general instructions that we don't get, and that that means we have to hear and read the books, and then specific instructions, practical instructions. Proper Prabhupada gave us on how to to do things, how to pay obeisances, how to greet each other, just just general etiquette. That it's also there in Prabhupada's instructions. So everything is there. And especially um, in the pronunciation of the mantras, it's very important. His Holiness Lokanath Swami Maharaj has written a book in 2009. It's called Pronounce It Correctly. It's a Sanskrit terminology he uses, which I don't remember the actual terminology. But it, he, he delineates all of our different worship services, both in the morning and the evening, along with different mantras we chant, and shows that many times we are not pronouncing correctly. So in, in the year 2009, the GBC got tolerant, got a little, got, devotees got a little bit intolerant that after so many years, devotees were still not pronouncing the mantras right. And so this was commissioned, and Maharaj wrote this book, and showing how we should pronounce the different mantras. Just like, <clears throat> I'll give you another example. Tulasi. We say, Tulasi Maharani, right? But what is Tulasi? Tulasi is you have one Lassi and then you... <laughs> Somebody says you want a second Lassi? Okay, well, we'll have two Lassi instead of just... One lassi, <laughs> but it's not two lassi. It's tulasi or tulsi. You can make it easy. Just say tulsi. But the end, the emphasis is on the I. The last is tulasi or tulsi. It's not tulasi. And Prabhupada, one time he was talking to his devotees. He said, uh, "Please don't call your spiritual master a cow." Vande Guru Shri Charanaravindu, Guru. Vande Guru Shri Charanaravindam. 
So the word is one day guru, guru, guru. Was it? One day guru, Sri. Guru, guru, G U R O H, right? Guru. It's not the one day garo, garo. The devotees were saying garo and so everything. Prabhupada said, I know you mean well, but please don't call your spiritual master a cow. <laughs> Hare 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 Namah Krishna Hare Hara Namah Krishna Hare Hara Namah Krishna All glories to Lord Shiva. <laughs> so the Sanskrit language is quite precise, and a slight deviation can give a completely different meaning. And those who know Sanskrit, because sometimes people who are experts or scholars come to our temple and they think, what are these people chanting, you know? Gadadhar. And what was it? Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar. Sri Vas. It's Gadadhar. Gadadhar. Gadadhara. Gadadhar. He is the holder of the club. Gadadhara. A gutted horror. <laughs> so we have a tendency to uh, somehow, it's not so much in India, usually in India people understand more, but in the West they make a mess of some of the mantras. It's really, you wonder where you are, what, what language is that? <laughs> so, but therefore, that's why the GBC commissioned Maharaj to write this book, and he did. And we de detailed very carefully how we chant. So when you chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. So it's Rama, Rama. You pull in the sound, Rama, Rama. And it's not like Rama, it's Rama. And you pull it in, Krishna, that's good, but Rama. It's like you pull in, it's like it's called guttural sound, those who know, uh, in, you know, the phonetics of language. So all of these, you might say, well, Maharaj, why are you harping on all these details, you know? Let's get to the essence. <laughs> but they, these, these things are there as a support in our execution of devotional service, and therefore we should follow very carefully. And when in the process of meditation, proper pronunciation increases the quality or the ability to meditate. When you're chanting clearly, the med meditation becomes more, uh, what we say, efficacious or more easily uh, available. When we don't chant clearly, it's hard to concentrate on the sound vibration. So it clearly means correctly also. Okay, so there's a little bit on, uh, on the importance of following carefully the instructions of the spiritual master as the foundation for the execution of devotional service, which leads to ultimately what we call transcendental consciousness. Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Criticisms? Suggested retractions, <laughs> suggested additions, <laughs> yes. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the class about uh, especially putting emphasis on the pronunciation. So I was wondering about this Tulasi. Tulasi. Yes sir. Prindayai Tulasi Devai. <laughs> so the actually it is la word is full so it will be actually pronounced as tulasi but when we say tulsi la word is pronounced only half so tulsi is not correct i think so because so it's tulasi tula is complete tulasi yeah. not tulasi but tulasi tu tulasi yes tu tula tulasi so even when we pronounce tulsi it la is half not full Oh, so that's not correct. Yes. Okay. I felt that. There, there goes my whole th program. <laughs> <laughs> so the, to get it exactly right is going to be very difficult then. 
So how, say it again, what is the actual clear correction? Tulasi. 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 Not Tulasi. Yeah, not Tulasi. 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 Okay, thank you. Brindaya Tulasi Devai. Is that it? Okay. Thank you. Okay, write that down. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yes. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, as you said that we cannot change the scriptures. Uh, similarly, for us, Srila Prabhupada's words are like, uh, they, are, they are scriptures, they are, they are his ecstasies. Uh, and you also mentioned that Acharyas, they write the commentary as per the time, place and circumstances. So many of the Srila Prabhupada's, uh, some sentences, which appears to be uh, not uh, applicable in current scenario because there are a lot of changes in the social system after Srila Prabhupada. Then how should we see that? Well, what you, what you, people say that what Prabhupada said when he was here is not applicable now because the social and political environment has shifted and mentalities and people have also also have altered. Well, therefore, it's, a, it's, it's the duty of the disciples and followers who are present to understand clearly the message given by their spiritual master and explain that same knowledge without changing the essence according to time, place, and circumstance. Yeah. And there's one, I forgot, one devotee, he's written a whole book one Prabhupada disciple, taking something that Prabhupada wrote and making it more, what we say, understandable to the common people. I think that we see that here. We have preachers who are part of Radha Gopinath who are doing that also. Because you know, to reach people where they are without changing the essence is really a great ability. It takes real clear understanding of the essence and at the same time, how best to present that essence in a way that is understandable. Just like, I don't know, what would be an example? Rather than telling people not to follow the four regulative principles, explain to them what is the meaning of the four regulative principles and how it benefits them rather than saying well you can't you can't you you can't do these four things and then leave it at that i mean Prabhupada did that but that was up for, up to us to understand and then also apply but then there was books written about that to explain what did they call the four principles of freedom, the four principles of knowledge, the four principles of detachment, uh, the f four regulative principles of execution of devotional, and so there's different terminologies to use. So according to your audience, just like I was just, just talking last night to a group of people online, how in some countries, I mentioned the countries, you can't mention the four regulative principles because people will they'll get up in the middle of your lecture and walk out. <laughs> I mean, seriously. These are Western countries, obviously. They'll get up and they'll just, they won't want to hear how no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. So in these countries, we don't even mention them. But we wait till people become more attached to the whole process of hearing, chanting, associating. And then we gradually introduce these things according to people who are more already committed to the practice. Prabhupada also did that. He didn't give everything at the beginning. He slowly gave it according to how we could under to accept it. So that's an art. <laughs> It's not, not everybody can do that. You had a question? No? Oh, okay. 
All right. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.